Uh, we thank you very much for being part of uh, today's event. Uh, we bring you greetings from the Institute of African Studies, University of Nigeria, Nsoka. My name is Ozioma Musilike. I'm the director of the ISUNN. And I'm very, very glad uh, to have you here for our speaker three on this platform. I'm going to introduce uh, Rebecca Wolf, and then we'll listen to her presentation. Um, Rebecca Wolf is an assistant professor of art history at Christopher Newport University, where she teaches courses on African art, global, modern, and contemporary art, and Latin American art. She received her BA from the University of Texas at, at Austin, her MA from Columbia University, and her PhD from UCLA. Her research focuses on modern and contemporary Nigerian art, and her current project is a means artistic production related to the Nigerian Civil War through the lenses of testimony, trauma, and memory. Her writing on African and African diasporic art has appeared in numerous journals and international edition card box. Join me to welcome Rebecca Wolf with a round of applause, please. So Rebecca, you're welcome. We'll now uh, listen to your presentation. After that, we'll have the Q&A session and um, interact around uh, your I'm here um, to listen to this talk that I'm going to give to you today. I'm really happy to be able to share this research with you, which I'm working on um, for an upcoming book project. And I'm happy to have this opportunity to reconnect with my friends and colleagues at the University of Nigeria in Suka after being so far away I've been unable to visit Nigeria for several years. So even if it's virtually, I'm happy to be able to connect with you all. I really look forward to questions and comments that we have after this um, and continuing the discussion. So the title of my talk is Unity and Empathy, Nigerian Art During the Nigerian Civil War. I want to begin with a quote from Kunle Akinsamoyan, who wrote his first editorial as the editor-in-chief of Nigeria magazine in the summer of 1968 in the middle of the Nigerian Civil War. He wrote, Nigeria has a soul. The spiritual element in her culture has seen to that. But that soul is in conflict, a bitter conflict which is not unusual in a growing nation. The fact that a soul is in conflict does not mean that it has split into two. Indeed, it is a common practice for an active soul to be in conflict in its efforts to maintain its ideals. This is what is happening to Nigeria, and no matter what happens, Nigeria's soul is destined to remain one. The augury for this is Nigerian art, which made its impact on the world on the foundation of unity that time has firmly entrenched. Here, Akin Samoyan offers his thoughts on the integrity of Nigerian unity, which Nigeria was fighting to keep intact. As he saw it, the fulcrum of Nigeria's united soul could be found in its art. To reiterate this point, the issue featured a two-page spread of most of the artists included in the exhibition Contemporary Nigerian Art, organized by the Society of Nigerian Artists, or SNA, and on view at the Commonwealth Institute in London. The point of this show was to convey an to an international audience that Nigerian creativity continued during wartime. These photographs, included in the Nigerian magazine spread titled Contemporary Nigerian Artists at Work, portrayed the artists painting, 
chiseling, printing, or lost in contemplation. Their images attested to the vibrancy of wartime Nigerian artistic practices. Indeed, in contrast to the disruption the conflict brought to artists in Biafra, the Nigerian art world functioned more or less as it did before, with opportunities for workshops and exhibitions. Because of this, it has often been assumed that the war did not affect artists outside of Biafra. Yet, the Nigeria Magazine feature also hints that the, that the war did, in fact, inform artists' activities. Contemporary Nigerian art was an exhibition funded by the government and meant to raise Nigeria's profile and showcase pan-Nigerian creativity at a time its war effort was strongly criticized in the international press. The SNA's organization of the show reflected that artists very much believed in the concept of Nigeria's united soul, that Akin Simoyan, Akin Simoyan voiced in his editorial, and that they were willing to use their art to promote this vision. To this day, the Nigerian federal military government, or FMG slogan, to keep Nigeria one is a task that must be done, which circulated in newspapers, radio broadcasts, and propaganda pamphlets, remained etched in the memories of artists who lived through the war on the Nigerian side. Even though artists wholeheartedly agreed with this mantra, they could not remain immune to the suffering and death that the conflict caused. Most of them did not experience wartime violence directly and watched it unfold at a distance. But as the artist Marina Oyelami has said, quote, I was far, far away from the scene of the fighting, far, far away, yet I felt it deep, deep down, end quote. The war affected Nigerian artists deeply. Many expressed empathy with the flight, plight of Biafrans, whom they saw as fellow Nigerians. Within the dynamic Nigerian art world, artists' anxieties about the war surfaced in their artworks. They created ruminations on death, culture, military intervention, and suffering. Artists felt passionately about and creatively responded to a war that, although physically far from them, often encroached on their lives. This talk examines how three Nigerian artists who advocated for a united Nigeria simultaneously lamented the human cost of war and questioned its impact on Nigeria's culture, society, polit and politics through their work. I start with the art of Bruso Nobrakpea, living in Lagos, for whom the war years were a time of both immense personal achievement and anguish. Then I look at the practice of Demas Nuoko, a Midwestern Igbo living in Ibadan. He constructed his new culture studios complex to assert his place in Nigeria and as an act of symbolic creation in the face of wartime destruction. Unlike other artists, Moko was able to travel to parts of former Biafra and produced a series of works that responded to what he saw there. Bruso Nobrakpea and Nwoko belonged to the Zaria Art Society, and along with Uche Okeke became the leading practitioners of natural synthesis. Positioning these artists' practices in relation to the war clarifies the influence that the Biafran struggle had on the direction of natural synthesis, which has predominantly been discussed in relation to aesthetic concerns of Nigeria's immediate post-independence years, overlooking the ways artists adapted their natural synthesis concepts in response to violence and political fragmentation. Then I look at another important artist working in a very different artistic milieu, Marina Oyelami. An Oshogbo artist, Oyelami assisted with the Oriol Lokun Center in Ife during the war years, and he sustained a wartime practice that commented on the politics behind the conflict and the death it brought. These artists reacted to a war that had a great psychological impact on them, yet remained at a great physical distance. Their understanding of the conflict was mediated through Nigerian information networks, particularly through the press and radio. Although not all outlets were owned by the FMG, they were expected to toe the official line or face consequences. As a result, press coverage often failed to fully convey wartime suffering, sometimes downplaying it and at times even justifying it as a necessary means to end the war and bring about Nigerian unity. 
When Obafemi Awolowo, who then served as the FMG's federal commissioner for finance, made his infamous statement to reporters that, quote, all is fair in war and starvation is one of the weapons of war. I don't see why we should feed our enemies fat only to fight us harder, end quote. It caused an uproar. Awolowo spoke specifically against shipping relief supplies to Biafrans, and in the Biafran and international press, his statement was met with horror and as evidence of Nigeria's genocidal wartime policy. The Nigerian press, however, doubled down on Awolowo's sentiment. The new Nigerian, steered by an editor known to be supportive of, FMG, of the FMG's policies, was perhaps the most vocal. A few days after Awolowo made international news, a headline quoted the Kaduna Chamber of Commerce boldly com proclaiming, let's starve the rebels to submission, and urging the FMG to reject establishing a relief supply corridor since they claim to humanitarian organizations also smuggled arms. And as if to completely squash any moral objections to purposefully starving a territory of millions of people, the paper followed up with a front page item that quoted a visiting Canadian Brigadier General confirming that starvation is a legitimate weapon of war. The war coverage in the Sunday editions of the Daily Times and the Daily Sketch, published in Lagos and Ibanu respectively, did, did include photos of refugee women and children. The Sunday Times front page for June 16, 1968, for example, shows a wide-eyed, malnourished boy. The accompanying text outlines the acute refugee crisis in the ever-shrinking Biafran territory, but with crucial context. The editorial beside it, after blaming the suffering of innocent civilians on the Juku's regime, asks, what else does one expect in war? Even while directly confronting its readership with wartime pain and suffering, the Sunday Times implies that civilian death is collateral damage in pursuit of the greater good. In a feature in the Sunday Sketch, published the same day, Photographs of Moreau's and English children shockingly illustrate a lead article's description of, quote, thousands of people, young and old, seriously afflicted by hunger, by misery, and hardships imposed on them by the secessionists, end quote. While this article clearly lays the blame for civilian suffering on Ajuku's regime, Nigeria was perhaps seen as too closely implicated for propagandistic comfort. Two weeks later, the Sunday sketch disavowed the photographs of Biafran children that it published as forgeries. The Nigerian press oscillated from blaming Ajuku for his people's condition to completely dismissing the suffering as fake news. In the context of this unreliable news coverage, artists did not deny or diminish wartime suffering and instead visualized it with empathy. The problem remained, however, of how to portray the manifestation of physical pain of others who were hundreds of miles away. At the same time, they had to reconcile their belief in Nigeria's united soul with their horror in response to wartime atrocities. They grappled with Nigeria's role as a perpetrator in a war that was fought to keep the nation intact, a goal that they ultimately supported. I argue that Ono Brakpea, Nwoko, and Oyelami practiced from a position of preemptive reconciliation. To them, Nigeria's soul would eventually cease to be fractured and become fully reunited once again. Biafrans were fellow Nigerians, and as Nigeria steadily regained territory, former Biafrans continuously re-became Nigerians throughout the war. Looking toward a post-war future that constantly seemed to be on the horizon, Onobrakpea, Nwoko, and Oyelami sensed an urgent need to come to terms with the extreme violence inflicted by one part of the body politic upon the other. And I will begin by looking at the art of Bruce Onobrakpea. The war years represented a turning point in Bruce Onobrakpea's artistic practice. He sees it as the time he reached a pinnacle in his experience with Nat experiments with natural synthesis, which he used to metaphorically address wartime tur turmoil and suffering. For Ono Brakpea, the conflict was a calamitous event that touched every Nigerian. Indeed, an early act of wartime violence occurred when Biafra dropped a bomb in the Yaba area of Lagos. While the daily lives of Lagosians continued more or less uninterrupted after this shocking event, the war dominated people's topics of conversation. 
Moreover, the governor of Lagos ordered a ban on drumming and general merrymaking in the city, stressing, quote, the need for sacrifice and redoubled vigilance, end quote, during wartime. While generally remaining removed from violence, Lagos denizens still felt the war's impact on their lives. In contrast to Uchi Okeke, whose devotion to Uli and his artistic practice cemented Igbo aesthetics as his foundation for natural synthesis, Onobrak Peya was much more eclectic in his sources. He not only drew from the Orobo and Edo forms of, from his upbringing, but also from the Hausa and Yoruba design elements he encountered as a student in Zaria and as a professional in Lagos. As Chiko Okeke Agulu writes, Onobrak Peya's natural synthesis, quote, feeds on the dynamic tension between forms and concepts from cultures that are decidedly indigenous by virtue of their constituting a part of the collective nat national heritage, end quote. Working from an understanding of Nigeria as a diverse but united country, Onobrak Peya's commitment to incorporating the aesthetics of cultures across its regions greatly informed how he responded to the war through its art, through his art. In 1966, the year of the massacres against Easterners and an incre and of increased tensions between the East and the rest of Nigeria, Father Kevin Carroll commissioned Onobrak Peya to make a Stations of the Cross series for St. Paul's Church in the Abuta Meta area of Lagos. When he agreed to the commission a year later, Carroll gave him limited instructions, that it be simple and easily understood by a broad audience. Onobrak Peya took Father Carroll's stipulation for the commission to create what he sees as a watershed moment in his artistic practice. He gave his own twist to the canonical theme by situating the passion within a Nigerian environment. In Jesus and the Women of Jerusalem, the woman to whom Jesus offers comfort and benedictions as he carries his cross could be women on the streets of mid-20th century Lagos. And Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus to carry the cross, Simon of Cyrene wears distinctly a robo clothes, perhaps reflecting on Obrak Peya's own Catholic convictions. The man filling the role of the Roman soldier behind them instead wears a colonial Nigerian uniform. Jerusalem under Roman control becomes transformed to 1950s Lagos under British colonialism. In both these paintings, the cross is densely patterned, and these designs are continued into the clothes of the townspeople and the composition's shallow backgrounds. Within the setting, the artist quotes Jesus as a Nigerian. For Ono Rakpea, incorporating these characters and design elements into the Catholic artistic tradition exemplified his vision of natural synthesis. He understands natural synthesis as a means to re-examine Nigeria's cultural and social values to promote a reaffirmation of these values on a broader cultural level. His Stations of the Cross series achieved just that by reflecting the artist's Catholic faith and the faith of millions of Nigerians while celebrating indigenous culture. Onobrak Peya began the studies for the panels within the first months of 1967, and he completed the 14 monumental paintings, each 4 by 10 feet, by the end of the year. Over the course of the eight weeks in which Onobrak Peya actually created the paintings, the Civil War brought upheaval that directly affected him. Biafran troops invaded the Midwest and got as far as Ore, just over 100 miles from Lagos, before being repelled back to Biafra. During this time, Onobrak Peya felt the threat to his Midwest home state and Lagos deeply. The Stations of the Cross series, which depicted Jesus' last day on earth as a man and his crucifixion, became an allegorical reflection of the pain and tribulations of his country. Onobrak Peya explains that as he was depicting the passion of Jesus, quote, Nigeria was going through another passion, end quote. Yet, the Stations of the Cross ultimately led to resurrection and redemption. For Ono Brakpeya, the paintings were a statement of triumph over suffering on a religious level, on a personal level, and on a national level. In the Stations of the Cross, he was simultaneously able to fully visualize his artistic philosophy and present a message of redemption as his country was plunged into violence and civil war. By 1969, however, Onobrak Peya's outlook towards the conflict had become more pessimistic. 
Lament, made that year, expresses his feelings of wartime devastation through the figure of a wailing woman. Similarly to the Stations of the Cross paintings, geometric designs appear on the woman's hips and torso and in a horizontal band behind her, through which Onobrakpea references body decorations, wood carvings, and textile patterns found in all regions of Nigeria. These designs symbolize the loss of cultural heritage the war caused. The violence in Biafra destroyed the art of the Igbo and other Eastern Nigerian ethnicities on a large scale. Wartime upheaval also led to the looting of many Igbo artworks that were then smuggled out of the country. This destruction and theft led to a great deficit in the region's cultural heritage, which for Onobrakpea endangered Nigeria's artistic legacy as a whole. At the same time, the Civil War threatened another Nigerian artistic legacy, that of the artists affiliated with natural synthesis. As Onobrak Peya and his peers initiated natural synthesis on the eve of Nigeria's independence in 1960, part of their motivation was to create a new artistic approach for their new nation. Now, two years into the war, the group found themselves split along hostile territorial borders, with Onobrak Peya, Nwoko, Yusuf Grilo, and Jimo Akolo in Nigeria, and Uche Okeke and Simon Okeke in Biafra. As John Picton has written, natural synthesis, quote, should be celebrated in the way one Nigeria was configured, end quote. And with Onobrakpea's pointed incorporation of pan-Nigerian indigenous designs in his works, he can certainly be seen as subscribing to this sentiment. His natural synthesis was grounded in his commitment to cross-cultural creativity. Onobrakpea's pan-Nigerian ideals of natural synthesis were greatly jeopardized by the war. Direct references to the war in Lament are scattered within the geometric designs in their, that represent Nigeria's artistic heritage. On the left side of the woman at the height of her hip, three men quarrel with fists drawn. Directly below, a man dressed in army fatigues bends to pick up a gun, preparing to go to war. On the right side of the woman, again at the height of her hip, a lone coffin appears. As Anobrakpea has explained, these figures represent the wailing woman's husband and son. In both Nigeria and Biafra, men volunteered or were recruited to join the army. In Biafra, especially toward the end of the war when lament was made, conscription targeting young boys was rampant. Whether fighting willingly or forced, the conflict led to many of these soldiers' deaths. The woman symbolizes the mothers, sisters, daughters, and wives left behind, who could only lament and grieve. Given this magnitude of human and cultural loss and the threat to his own conceptions of the integrity of Nigerian modern art, it is unsurprising that Onobrakpea included a strong element of angry critique in lament. In Orobo and Igbo culture, when women publicly undress and present their naked bodies, it is a powerful act of protest and condemnation, which occurred most prominently in Nigerian history in the Aba Women's Revolt against British imposed tax laws during the colonial period that instigated Nigeria's struggle for independence. By depicting the wailing woman as nude, Onubrakpea taps into this effective form of civil disobedience with strong political resonance to produce an anti-war work. As someone behind the front lines who grieves for the war at a distance, the woman in Lament can be seen as an avatar for Onubrakpea, who was in a similar position. Her howl of rage and sadness becomes the artist's own. In 1970, Onobrakpea again turned to a metaphorical representation of the war. The plastograph Free, Fright, Free Fight in the Blind Underworld illustrates a scene from the book The Forest of a Thousand Demons, written by Daniel Ofagunwa and translated from Yoruba to English by Wole Shawinka, in which an altercation between two people quickly gets out of control and consumes an entire town. In Onobrak Pea's depiction of the mayhem, two large figures are locked in combat. Like the Wailing Woman in Lament, they are decorated with dense geometric patterns, but the destruction they preside over is entirely of their own making. Adults and children lie trampled beneath their feet. A figure reaching out from the lower right corner begs them to stop, but they remain impervious to his plea and the surrounding chaos. 
The victimized figures are also covered with pan-Nigerian designs, which reference Yoruba Adire, Northern Indigo dye patterns, and Sibidi and Uli. The clash of personalities between Ojukwu and Gowan is often given as a main cause of the war, and it does not take much to extend an allegorical meaning to free fight in the underworld. The two fighting figures represent Gowan and Ajukwu, whose personal antipathy and dueling political ambitions led to an all-consuming conflict that came at the great detriment to the Nigerian people. In, in this work, Anobrakpea condemns the human folly that led to needless carnage. As Anobrakpea strove toward interethnic and interregional representation in his art, his philosophy dovetailed with a slogan that the FMG began to circulate during the war, unity in diversity. In fact, Onobrakpea went on to title many of his post-war works featuring figures representing Nigeria's different ethnicities with this phrase. Despite this alignment with the federal government's messaging, his work registered this extreme distress that the war caused him. Whether he observed the conflict from a distance or felt its looming threat as it drew nearer on significant occasions, he returned to metaphors, or he turned to metaphors to express his conflicting feelings toward the redemptive potential of a reunited Nigeria and his despair over the human and cultural costs of the war. Now I will turn to the art of Demas Moko. During the war, Demas Moko represented Nigeria on the world stage on two important occasions. In October 1968, he brought a dance troupe to the Mexico Olympics that performed a show based on pan-Nigerian dance movements and masquerades. In July 1969, he was part of the Nigerian contingent to the first Pan-African Cultural Festival held in Algiers, during which he staged his dramatic adaptation of Amos Tutuola's novel, The Palm Wide Drinker. Despite these activities, Moko's position within a united Nigeria was often contested. Although he had lived in Ibadan and taught at the University of Ibadan, or UI, since the early 1960s, his hometown is just west of the Niger River in Nigeria's Midwest state, and he is Igbo. Many Igbo from this area, because they had family in the East, were accused of supporting Biafra and aiding the Biafran invasion into the Midwest. By the time the war began, Nuoko was one of the few Igbo who remained at UI. As anti-Igbo riots spread across Ibadan in March 1967, the Eastern staff who had not already left fled, fled back to their region. In total, the university lost over 40 of its lecturers. Anti-Midwest Igbo sentiment was rampant on campus. UI's acting vice chancellor, John Harris, publicly announced to the university community that, quote, one of the major problems has been the number of Igbos, mostly Western Igbos, still employed here. They are a considerable source of anxiety because their presence arouses strong feelings, end quote. In response to wartime fear-mongering embedded in statements like this, the military guard was brought in to patrol the campus, the university set up a series of surveillance measures and restricted access to many of its buildings, including the arts building, where, where Nwoko worked, and a civil defense group enforced strict curfews. Midwestern students and staff were regarded with fear and distrust. Although Nwoko believed in Nigerian unity and saw Biafran secession as a wasted effort, his identity as a Midwest Igbo made him a target of suspicion. Nevertheless, Nwoko vehemently continued to believe in his place within the Nigerian polity. He resolutely put down root, roots in Ibadan, beginning the construction on an art complex he called New Culture Studios in 1967. Sitting at the top of the Makola Hill area of Ibadan, New Culture Studios has a stage and amphitheater complete with a lobby, studios for painting, sculpture, pa printing, and architecture, and Nwoko's own private residence. Without the funds to hire contractors, he built the structure himself, digging out the laterite of the lot to form bricks, which he then used as his building materials. He also envisioned new cultural studios as a powerful symbolic gesture of how the nation could rebuild once the war ended. 
To him, the war could only end with Biafra eventually becoming reincorporated into the rest of Nigeria, so the studio complex functioned as a direct message to his Biafran friends, colleagues, and family to tell them that, and I quote, for every block that was pulled down in the east, I would put up one block on top of each other, in Ibadan. For every house that was bombed and destroyed, I would add one block. So when you came back in the end, you would see something standing to use and your sense of loss could be really diminished. If you came back and saw something standing that was quite a structure, there could be hope. Not even hope, but you wouldn't say that everything was lost. Nwoko built New Culture series Studios as a beacon of recreation in the midst of wartime destruction. He conceived of the complex as a message of conciliation and empathy towards Biafrans as he looked to a post-war future that fostered collaboration and creativity instead of antagonism. Despite Moko's reasons for building New Culture Studios, his neighbors regarded his activities with suspicion and at times hostility. They thought it strange that he would build a home in the West during the war that was often framed as a fight between the Igbo and the rest of Nigeria. Nigerian propaganda generally blames Biafran secession and the ensuing conflict on Ajuku and his elite clique and called for tolerance and friendship towards Igbos, extending the protection of the Nigerian state to former Biafrans. Yet, even with this rhetoric of acceptance and multi-ethnic nationalism, ugly anti-Igbo messaging still appeared, which helped fuel anti-Igbo sentiments that have manifested themselves as UI's harsh surveillance measures and Ibadan's riots. Within this context, Noko's neighbors sometimes threatened to tear New Culture Studios down as he built it since they believed he should have left Ibadan with the other Igbos. He would respond that they could destroy it if they wished, but only after he finished construction. Either way, as he explains, it was bound to be a monument. New Culture Studios proclaimed Nwoko's presence and permanence in Ibadan's cultural sphere, despite the fear-mongering fear and suspicion around him. Furthermore, Nwoko's New Culture Studios reflected the development of his ideas surrounding natural synthesis. Different from the ethnically focused approach of Okeke and the eclecticism of Onobrak Peya, Nwoko's natural synthesis, according to Chika Okeke Agulu, quote, presupposes that national citizenship endows him with the freedom to claim as his own any cultures and heritages within the borders of the nation state. Since one is first a Nigerian and Igbo or Yoruba or Hausa after, end quote. During the war, Nwoko began to reconceptualize this philosophy as new culture, which, laid the, which he laid the foundations for in a speech titled Search for a New African Theater, given in the, at the 1969 Pan-African Festival in Algiers. In this talk, Nwoko condemned colonialism's simultaneous effort to deny Africa its culture and dictate its direction. Echoing natural synthesis, he explained that since Europeans had so successfully imposed their culture on Africans that it became an unescapable, the African artist is thus faced with the task of creating art for a new culture that draws from indigenous forms of creativity without completely abandoning the West. When he came to the role, when it came to the role of the artist who practiced this new culture, he de-emphasized ethnic identity in favor of a national and even broader African identity. In his speech, he called for a move away from ethnic ties as the basis for post-colonial African identity, and instead valued the national and the continental. Striving towards the national and eventually pan-Africanist culture that his new culture envisioned, Nwoko aspired to move beyond the confines of his, his ethnic heritage in his life and work. This ambition can be seen in his conviction to rightfully claim Ibadan as the city in which he is entitled to live and create art. New Culture Studios itself also reflected his ideals. As noted earlier, he constructed the complex out of bricks created from the earth of, of the site, exploring how the mud material historically used for Ibadan's domestic dwellings could be transferred to modern architecture. He followed basic indigenous 
principles of design, including the sparse use of windows to keep out the hot Nigerian sun and the series of ventilation shafts for airflow. In this way, he erected a structure using indigenous building techniques that could not be described as anything but modern. As new culture tried to break down the boundaries between the ethnic and the national on the rhetorical level, on the level of practice, it made strides in challenging binary perceptions of the so-called traditional and the so-called modern. This interest in utilizing indigenous building technologies stemmed from his earlier successful natural synthesis experiments in which he reimagined the ancient art making of the Nok culture, who lived in northern Nigeria between 1500 BCE and 500 CE. In the mid-1960s, Nwoko created terracotta sculptures in a kiln of his own invention that combined the designs of Nok kilns with the open flame firing techniques of Igbo sculptors. He returned to the medium in 1968 during the war to create a sculptural series, one of which is Soja that we see here. While Soja has the hollow eyes and nostrils typical of Nox sculpted figures, Nwoko used uses his own form of stylization to create an unnerving and unsettling soldier in the Nigerian army. His helmet seems to meld into his head, giving him a skull-like visage that is emphasized by his striated eyes, thin face, and cage-like teeth. Despite his grotesque appearance, he stands in contraposto, one hand casually tucked into the pocket of his uniform. The soldier thus appears simultaneously terrifying and mundane. As radio broadcasts and printed news circulated updates on the destruction of the war, they also provided justifications for it, as we saw earlier. By infusing Soja's gruesomeness with a pose of nonchalance, Moko encapsulates this normalization of violence during armed conflict. At the same time, with his skeletal countenance, the soldier embodies death, both its cause and its physical manifestation. For Nwoko, the broader meaning of this soldier is rooted in his ideas about human nature. As the artist has said in a 1968 interview, quote, Now, for example, I am doing soldiers, but that is not just because of the Civil War. In college, I did a series of warriors. The themes keep recurring. If man fights, it is not because there is one reason or other to fight now, but it is because man will always fight. So I begin to see the soldiers not through what they're doing at the moment, but because of their nature as soldiers, they're always going to do that, and there is practically no end to it. End quote. Soja speaks to Nwoko's understanding of the human condition, a condition that, at the time of its making, caused the military takeover of his country and the pursuit of a futile war. The skeletal Soja echoes the ghoulish and emaciated faces of the figures in his combatant one in Combatant 2, two paintings that he made after he visited the Inuku and Nsuka areas once they had fallen into ni two Nigerian forces in October 1967. Immediately after retaking Anugu, the FMG sent the academic Upaki Asika, also based at the University of Ibadan and a friend of Nuoko's, to act as its administrator. Claiming it as the capital of the newly created Nigerian East Central State. With the area now firmly under Nigerian control, Nwoko describes the absurdity of heavily armed soldiers simply milling around on the road between Anugu and Nsuka, an experience that seems to have informed the horrifying banality of Soldier. During this time, he created sketches that he developed into paintings after returning to Ibadan. Okeke Ogulu notes that despite Nwoko's personal interaction with a Biafran soldier he befriended during his visit, his resultant images of combatants are not of humanity and individualization, but rather, quote, commentaries on the soldier as a monstrous figure whose forced intervention in the body politic has spelled disaster for independent Nigeria, end quote. To extend this reading further, I would argue that Moko does not just turn his soldiers into monstrous figures. He drains them of their humanity completely, portraying them as no different from their instruments of war. 
and combatant two, the soldier's physical body is dwarfed by his ammunition belt and his giant automatic weapon, which stretches all the way up from his boot to his shoulder. These accoutrements of war overwhelm his human form, threatening to swallow him up completely. In combatant one, as in Soja, the soldier's helmet and skull are indistinguishable, <clears throat> and he bears the same cage-like teeth. The enlarged chevrons of his uniform and his, heavily, and his heavy vest filled with munitions weigh down his body, and these military fatigues serve as the sole marker of his identity. His skin is the same color as his automatic rifle, and where his hand grips his gun, it is difficult to distinguish between flesh and metal. Indeed, the weapon almost appears as an extension of the soldier's arm. To emphasize the smelting between human and machine, Nuoko makes the soldier's glowing eyes echo the hardware of his gun. Combatant 1 is a depersonalized cyborg. In line with his comments about the inherent condition of soldiering in his 1968 interview, Nuoko presents these combatants as in, this combatant as an automaton of death. Noko's complete disillusionment in the power of the military government to save Nigeria from disintegration came with his recognition that the war was a culmination of Nigeria's political development since independence. Through the region regionalization of political identities, as he put it, quote, we were fracturing ourselves apart, end quote. He expressed his indignation at these divisive processes through the figure of a glum and defeated warrior in Hunter in a war scene. The immediate impetus behind the work seems to have been an encounter with a Biafran soldier in the reincorporated Nsuka area. The sole survivor of a confrontation between the two armies, the man remained dazed by the violence and death that he had seen. In the painting, Nwoko creates a visual metaphor for the soldier's experience. Filled with amorphous shapes resembling dead bodies and pools of blood, it appears as if the morose hunter's body, the, the morose hunter's only recourse after witnessing the scene of death and decay is to toss his weapons aside and sit in a state of hopelessness. The hunter is a stand-in for the soldier. His elongated face appears to be a less stylized version of the face of the figure in Combatant 2. Moreover, the thorns and the barren trees that grow out of the corpses and hunter in a war scene are reminiscent of ominous vine-like growths that emerge from the groin of Combatant 2, wrapping around his legs and spreading towards his torso. This plant imagery, given its placement in these two paintings, symbolizes that in the military's attempt to birth a new and reunited Nigeria through a successful war effort, their tactics instead only beget a cycle of death. While defoliated trees have been a feature in Nwoko's artistic imagery since the early 1960s, they take on special meaning within the context of the war. Reports circulated that the Nigerian army often left a wake of denuded vegetation wherever they went. At times, these accounts were met with derision, that Nigerian troops were so poorly trained that they shot into the trees instead of at actual targets. In other instances, they were seen as evidence of the Nigerian army's wanton acts of destruction. Either way, for Nwoko, these accounts could only reinforce his belief in the incompetence of the Nigerian military government. He saw a complete lack of leadership within the FMG as it fumbled in its effort to, both to govern the country and to wage the war. Unlike Onobrak Peya and Oyelami, who we'll turn to in just a moment, Nwoko could come to these conclusions based on his experience in the reintegrated Enugu and Nsuka areas. He knew what reconciliation and reintegration looked like in practice. Even as he developed his ideas of new culture for a reunited Nigeria through New Culture Studios, his series of soldiers issued a grave warning about the militarization of Nigerian politics based on the destruction he saw firsthand. They embodied the banality of evil, as theorized by Hannah Arendt and her critics. 
In the paintings, ordinary Nigerian men drawn to soldiering either through a sense of patriotic duty or as an opportunity for professional and economic advancement, transformed into blunt instruments of the state and were stripped of their humanity in the process. In Soja, he captured the grotesque casualness that results from the normalization of violence. Indeed, these works presage the decades of military rule. Now, lastly, we come to Moraina Oyelami. Oyelami, who had come out of the Ambari and Bio workshops in Ashoko and by the late 1960s, was also affiliated with Oriolo Kun and Ife, made a significant body of war-related work, which he sustained from the months leading up to the war's outbreak through to its end. Living in Ashogbo, where he worked in the town's art museum, he recalls periodic visits from the army for recruitment drives, which eventually turned into conscri conscriptions. He received constant news about the war from both Radio Nigeria and Radio Biafra, which often had a strong enough signal to be heard in Nigeria. <clears throat> Oyelami astutely observed the war and created works that offered critiques of its surrounding politics while attempting to come to terms with the deaths its violence caused. In the painting Closed Door Meeting from 1967, he comments on the insincerity of the ultimately futile political meetings leading up to Biafra's secession. According to Jean Kennedy, a close creative confidant of Oyelami's, the artist made this painting around the time of the Aburi meeting in January 1967, during which Gowan Ojuku and the other regional military leaders met in Aburi Ghana through the auspices of the Ghanaian head of state. The Aburi Conference was the final time the FMG and the Eastern Regional Government attempted to reach a compromise on the political organization of Nigeria to, present the, to prevent the East's secession. Although an agreement seemed to have been made during the conference, Guan quickly reneged on this deal upon returning to Nigeria. In the uproar that followed, the Eastern Regional Government released verbatim reports of the Aburi meeting, which transferred the leader, transformed the leaders' closed-door conversations into widely circulated public knowledge. Since these documents proved in many people's eyes that Gowan had agreed to Ajuko's demands only to later walk them back, on Aburi We Stand became a rallying cry for Eastern secessionists. The contention over Aburi's meaning and its political implications became the first big rhetorical battle within the Nigerian Civil War's propaganda war. In the composition, a group of men and a vulture surround a table with a symbolic filled with symbolic table servings. Together, these objects represent the aspects of civil society that good governance is supposed to administer, support, and develop. The book signifies education, the food is agriculture, the money is finance, and the beer is social welfare. They are, they are also all things one might normally find on a table. In a jolt of symbolic surrealism, however, a dead body disrupts the, these quotidian objects. Standing in for all the Easterners massacred in the North from May to October 1966. Another all-important responsibility of the government is to protect life, but as Oyelami makes clear through the inclusion of the corpse, it was not met. The artist reminds the viewer that it was the violence against Easterners that necessitated meetings such as the Aburi conflict conference in the first place. The figures surrounding the table represent those with stakes in the future structure of Nigeria's government. The spectacled man sitting on the right center of the table facing the viewer is the politician Obafemi Awolowo. Kennedy identifies the small figure after, as Gawan after Oyelami vaguely alluded to it as, quote, someone who has no mouth, end quote. Gawan was often perceived as the leader of Nigeria in name only, following the directors of northern leaders instead 
of creating his own policies. Gowan has also been characterized by observers as overly receptive to the desires of British government representatives, who allegedly convinced him to abandon the deal reached out of Bury. Indeed, the vulture at the table symbolizes outside intervention in the buildup to the war, as British and foreign oil interests watched the tension between the East, which claimed the majority of Nigeria's oil reserves and the rest of the country with apprehension. At the same time, this scene does not only represent the Aburi meeting, especially since Awolowo was not even there. Instead, his bespeckled figure alludes to the ad hoc constitutional conferences that were held earlier and attended by both military leaders and politicians. For Oyelami, these meetings were merely a form of political jockeying in which everyone was only out for their own personal interests. The vulture reinforces this interpretation. As an animal who lives by eating carrion, it metaphorically feasts on the body lying on the table, representing those who benefit from armed conflict. Because of these meetings and fundamental insincerity, Oyelami implies, they fail to keep Nigeria together. While he roots closed door, door meeting and actual events that took place, Oyelami purposefully precludes identifying attributes for his figures, with the exception of the glasses and cap for Awolowo. As Kennedy points out, the artist often fuses genre figures, individual portraits, and archetypal images into one composition. Thus, the people around the table can be Gowan, a beardless Ajuku, an image that circulated widely before the war began, and various politicians and regional military leaders who all came together to discuss Nigeria's future in the months before the war. By the same token, the figure that Kennedy names as Gowan can be interpreted more broadly as any person who plays the role of a pawn in this game of political maneuvering. This meaning, however, is challenged by the artist's own reinterpretation of his painting. Speaking decades after he created Closed Door Meeting, Oyelami claimed that the small figure was standing on, not sitting at, the table, and that its lack of mouth represented the voiceless minority of people who truly desired peace. In this reading, the mouthless face represents the gagged cries for peace by those who were not allowed a seat at the negotiations. The painting can thus be open to multiple interpretations, which I believe is exactly the point. Kennedy writes that Oyelami strives to make images that are open enough to have multiple readings while remaining appropriate to his society's cultural needs. He does this, she explains, through the creation of archetypal figures that adhere to Yoruba aesthetic standards. Like Oriki, they have a commemorative presence, and like Ebeji figures, they exist in the middle ground between abstraction and naturalism. They also adhere to the Yoruba custom of depicting intensity of feeling rather than surface emotion, as she calls it, and most importantly for this discussion, they maintain a kind of anonymity. Aside from Awolowo, who could in fact also be read as Namdi Azikiwe, since he wore glasses and a superficially similar cap, none of the figures have defining characteristics. They are all ambiguous enough that they could be a rotating cast of characters that came to the table depending on the context of when the work is viewed. For example, during the time Oyelami created the work, these figures could be those present at the ad hoc constitutional conferences and the Aburi meeting, as I have argued. However, as the war dragged on, Nigeria and Biafra held a number of peace talks, which each side heralded as proof of their willingness to end the conflict. The media gave substantial attention to these talks, and much fanfare surrounded them, but each time they ended in a stalemate. A similar cast of characters who attended the pre-war meetings formed the peace talk committees, including Awolowo. Thus, Oyelami created a painting that comments upon the continuous failed negotiations held between the fighting parties, both before and during the conflict, to critique the hollow attempts at reaching a peaceful settlement. <clears throat> About a year later, Oyelami utilized <clears throat> archetypal figures to comment upon the multitude of deaths caused by the wartime violence. In the victims, bodies recalling the figure on the table and closed door meeting lay on a path leading up to a Biafran village. 
The uniformity and the regimented way the bodies are laid out give the impression that these figures were killed in an organized way, as if they were purposefully massacred. To Oyelami, the conflict is an instance of genocide, and his depiction of the dead and the victims reflects this belief. He made at least two other paintings of victims during this time, pairs of figures who left destitute or homeless by the 1966 massacres or the beginning military incursions of the war, limped sadly toward an unknown future. In these works, such as one also titled The Victims, the figures are haggard, crying, and mournful, but they are still alive. They have somewhat individuated facial features and express different emotions. In the later painting, however, these figures are transformed into uniform bodies with no identification except as archetypal hordem. Lying unceremoniously on the ground, they appear destined for a mass unmarked grave. In the 1968 Victims, Oyelami explores abjection. As Julia Kristeva has theorized, the abject is brought about by liminality and ambiguity, which, quote, disturbs identity system order, end quote. For her, the corpse represents a complete instance of abjection, since it transgresses established boundaries and, quote, represents fundamental pollution, a body without a soul, a non-body, end quote. The victims, in the victims, the corpses remain largely unpainted, which causes them to contrast starkly with the rich reds, greens, and deep earth tones of their surrounding environment. A vibrantly colored townscape becomes a scene of mass death, catapulting the viewer into a state of abjection as the distinction between genres breaks down and she processes the horror of what she is beholding. At the same time, as their inability to be part of the town symbolizes, they erode and pollute the well-being of the entire body politic. As, Oyelim, as Oyelami has said, the war, quote, affected the whole sanity of the nation, end quote. Receiving the news of massacres, atrocities, and likely seeing images of starving people in newspapers, he created the victims as a way to attest to the corrosive effect the conflict had on the entire country. Yet, in Reincarnation, also from 1968, Oyelami solves the issue of the corpse without a soul by displaying both the deceased and his spirit. The dead person's eyes are covered by a prominent black paint mark, a riff on the Yoruba custom of putting cottons, cotton on the dead's eyes, nose, and mouth. Oyelami depicts the moment that the spirit leaves the body, which hovers over the corpse as a pale, genderless, disembodied face. It is before, as Oyelami explains, the spirit, quote, enters into the womb of another human being, end quote. Here, the spirit begins its ascent into its new life. Oyelami is intimately familiar with the Yoruba belief in reincarnation in his personal life. His grandmother and his aunt called him Adabesi, Adabesi after one of his uncles who died and whose incarnation they believed him to be. As the embodied reincarnation of a deceased relative himself, this conception of cyclical life and rebirth was a powerful way in which Oyelami could process the incessant news of wartime deaths. His ability to both attest to and cope with suffering is rooted in the personal. As Oyelami says about his artistic response to the war, quote, I was far, far away from the scene of the fighting, far, far away, but I felt it deep, deep down. End quote. Tapping into these strong emotions, he created artworks that condemn the violence of war and the insincere efforts of those in power to put a stop to it. At the same time, he has written in his autobiography, quote, I will use my artistic medium to promote unity, to assert the authenticity of my culture, and that's all I can do. That's what I call being patriotic, end quote. These paintings were not private meditations through which he could process his emotions. He wanted them to be seen by an audience. To that end, he exhibited them in 1967 at the German Cultural Center in Lagos. Although he had not yet made the victims in reincarnation, he did show his other victim paintings, which seemed to have made an impact. 
For him, promoting Nigerian unity was to comment on the political upheaval and violence that had befallen his fractured nation through the paradigms of Yoruba culture. By exposing and testifying to these events, Nigeria could then move forward. Although Anobrak Paya, Nwoko, and Oyelami approached their wartime works in very different ways, they came to their practice from the conviction, in line with Kunle Akinsamoyan's editorial that I opened with, that even while Nigeria's soul was in conflict, it remained united. Yet, despite their belief in one Nigeria, it became imperative for these artists to expose the violence and political consequences of what was being done in the name of unity. While they did not witness wartime events, with the exception of Nwoko, they nonetheless felt the ethical need to express the suffering, pain, death, and loss of cultural heritage that the conflict caused. Moreover, many of these artists looked ahead toward a post-war future in their work and visualized reconciliation. What would happen to Nigeria's soul once it ceased to be in conflict? How could the nation move past the violence? For Onabrakpeya, it seemed to be the idea of unity and diversity. For Nwoko, the concept of new culture provided a pathway for post-ethnic and adaptive creativity. For Oyelami, the need for empathy, remembrance, and critique was paramount. These different approaches serve as important foundations for the ways artists would come to remember and grapple with the conflict's legacy in the post-war era. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I, as I said, I am really looking forward to our discussion that we'll turn to now. And please don't hesitate to email me afterwards if you want to continue the conversation um, and be in touch. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. <laughs> that was a very uh, stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, I'll just read out two comments that I already hear yeah, sent by those that uh, online. And then all the other people that are online and who want to ask questions, make comments, please can just drop your comment on the chat box and then we'll read it out to her. And then those who are in person here, um, you also have the liberty to put up your hand and uh, take the mic for any question or comment. Um, Amuchi Naveze says, Go on was not on the table and has lived longer to bear more of the slaves of the war. Um, Chris Ihobi says, at the end of the Civil War in Nigeria, the slogan adopted was no victor, no vanquished. However, like in most wars, there was indeed a victor who eventually uh, controlled the narrative. Who eventually controlled yeah, the narrative. The vanquished are not even allowed to tell their side of the story in Nigeria till today. How can the vanquished tell their story in Nigeria today? Um, I'm sure that Rebecca is taking notes, so those other people who are here in person uh, can now give their comment or questions. Thank you very much. I had the uh, way she mentioned um, ethnicity, uh, nation, and the uh, continental. Uh, Rebecca, I would want to ask you, uh, from your experience researching uh, the Civil War, in Nigeria, and uh, uh, being an art historian of African art, uh, a historian of African art, how do you define, do you think uh, nations, if we go to uh, somebody who wrote, uh, I can't remember the name immediately, uh, um, Africa and the, and the body of the nation uh, state, or even the cause, of the nation state. Are they really a nation? Is Nigeria a nation in the real sense of it? Is it possible to um, obliterate 
or jettison uh, the ethnic identity and the level, I mean, uh, move on to a higher level, if, if that is what you mean, of uh, nationality or nationalism, depending on what you want to uh, pursue in your thesis. For me, um, in relation to art, I've argued elsewhere that Nigerian art does not exist beyond the, 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 the concept of uh, geography. If you say uh, art produced in a place called Nigeria or uh, by somebody named Nigerian because of um, um, the violence of 1914, because that is what it is. Uh, um, banding uh, uh, the string bedfellows together and naming them something. And they have continued, people are killing themselves, that become more and more violent in recent times. Because if you really look at what happens with governance in this part of the world, military, uh, um, civilian, it is merely um, the distribution of violence. At times, it is minimal in the um, military regime because you have fewer people perpetrating or dishing out violence and corruption. If you have um, the so-called democracy, you have more people. Violence is uh, um, uh, literally decentralized. Corruption is literally, uh, literally decentralized. To me, these are operations, and they do not uh, approximate what one would call a nation. Nigeria is not a nation, and we have to come to terms with that. I have argued that Nigerian has beyond the, 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 the bounds or the needs for convenience. It does not exist. I'm a new artist, first of all. Because I have to travel with a Nigerian passport, maybe if I'm going to Britain, if you ask me, I'll say Nigerian artist. If I get out of here, and you have been around here, I was part of your uh, research, uh, some of the travels, but I think we need to question this. There are some of these artists who, are produ who produce this, they didn't see the war, and it, it's a uh, uh, um, now clear to them, uh, when them as work to say that they try to, because they were in Ambari and then when the war broke out, uh, Eastern artists had to scamper to Eastern Nigeria and left them, maybe from a point of view of nostalgia, or maybe they were missing their colleagues, they wanted them to come back. But they, I, I don't think they were operating from a point of view of justice. For those artists who abandoned Lagos uh, and the Badan and fled back to, to the East. So we need to question this thing. We need to find out from them is there justice in Nigeria? The civil war. I think you need to look at uh, I'm worried about ethnicity, I'm worried about uh, uh, I mean, uh, nation in terms of your uh, definition. So. If you want to address that file, if you want to look at that in the course of your uh, research, in the larger course of your research, fine. Thank you. I also want to find out uh, why the works that were shown seem to seem not to have gone deeper than one should expect. Because uh, many of these people mentioned here are not anyhow artists, at least uh, Bruce of Nobra Prayer and uh, Demas Woko. And they also have their colleagues at the other you know, side of the divide. I was expecting something stronger. I've also interviewed uh, Demas Woko and um, 
I don't know how he responded when, it, uh, when you discussed about things happening on the other side. He usually called the people, <laughs> my president, he called them Nibo, that is, Nibo people, as if he was not one of the one who he was not, uh, he is not Igbo. You know, just like, they just mentioned it like that, and being an, a younger person, I only noted it, I didn't begin to probe. So, and also, I'm also worried that uh, something as serious as the Asaba massacre did not attract attention, the attention of um, somebody like Demas. I was thinking that there will, there will be something very remarkable. There is certain commentary in his art that will reflect what happened in Asaba. You may need to ask him that question. And also, um, some of the examples that I saw there could pass for mere military presence, not necessarily the, the, the Biafra-Nigeria conflict, but military and politics, like the soldier. I know the series of uh, soldier come, soldier stay, and uh, soldier go. I can't really remember the dates of them, but, but they may have been produced the same time. I, I can't be confused with the with the title, just soldier. I know the, there are other soldiers. <laughs> you, know, you may need to uh, investigate that. In your last, uh, in your presentation when you came to Nsuka, you unveiled the exhibition, the Biafran exhibition that was taken to Germany. Um, it was written in German. I, couldn't, uh, I think I got some of the, in, in, to translate some of the things there. And how um, he, um, Uche Okeke wrote the history of uh, Biafran art, something that became similar, just cut out what could have been the, the, the world that included Demas and he just wrote. I want to know what uh, these, would be, these other people's reaction, what, I want to know their reaction to that, uh, that publication and also how they, what they thought about the um, exhibition in Germany, the Afro exhibition in Germany. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Rebecca, my name is Elkinti, Enoji. Um, it's good to hear from you after a long time. Um, uh, I believe you will um, look at the exhibitions from both sides of the divide during the war that came to Europe as propaganda. Um, if you could do a comparative analysis of the art from the Biafran side and the arts from the federal divide and as the third view and looking at the politics, how did the Europeans receive these artworks and the messages that were contained in them? Stand up. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I also, unless if you chose those three, just for the sake of uh, making this presentation, or if the cartoons are classified as maybe lower art or something else, but I know the, the people that really commented on the Civil War uh, on the Nigerian side were the cartoonists. There were some cartoons that uh, directed their focus on um, on the, the Civil War. I think you need to find out to help your work. Yeah, definitely. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Drs. Ikwesmi, Onora, and to Dr. Kingsley as well. It's really nice to hear from you again. 
um, after and see you again, even if it's just through a computer screen. Um, these are really, um, really interesting questions and comments. And I think to just begin with the order that, that they were given, um, that, yeah, is it possible to jettison ethnic identity? I, I mean, I don't know if I necessarily subscribe to Nwoko's new culture as something that can be um, actually feasible given geopolitical realities um, and social realities and cultural realities on the ground. Um, it seems like it might have been a much more idealistic point of view um, when he was kind of, when he was seeing the nation state of Nigeria shatter before him, and he was you know a direct recipient of the um, animosity and hatred that can come with um, ethnic divisions. And I mean, you bring in something really, really interesting that the whole identity of Nigeria is rooted in violence, rooted in this 1914 moment. And that violence is almost the way I understood the way that you were saying it is that it's almost kind of embedded and that it just comes out in different ways um, as history is moving along. And that's something really, really interesting that I think I need to sit with and really think about and think about how that interesting idea and see how that might come, how that might be manifested in art that is about Nigerian identity, especially Nigerian identity, at moments of content, uh, at moments of conflict, whether more contemporary art that was made this decade or um, more historical art made during the Nigerian Civil War, and so, um, yeah, and I think I, I'm curious. You know, as you mentioned, we visited Damas Moko in 2019. Um, and I, and I didn't ask him whether he still subscribed to this idea of new culture and this idea of going beyond um, ethnic identity and embracing a Nigerian identity. Um, he seems to have a very pessimistic view of what of, of the state of Nigeria today, and or at least in 2019. Um, so it would be interesting to follow back up with him, as you mentioned, um, and also with someone like Bruce Obrakpea and ask them now um, what they, how they feel like ethnicity functions um, in Nigerian art and as um, a marker of Nigerian art, or even, you know, if Nigeria is a failed nation, can we even call things um, Nigerian art? And I, I mean, I think we still can, but but that's definitely something to interrogate and think about. And um, yeah, and I think that this work can lead to those questions and those investigations. So thank you so much for that comment. That leaves me with a lot to think about and um, you know ponder as I continue working on this research. Well, thank you also, Chijioke, for your comment. I think it's really interesting that you were felt you don't you expected something more, um, like a more forceful reaction. Um, and there were I, I took this out. Um, it's in the original. It's in my dissertation, and I actually took it out for this because to just focus on these three artists, but there were other artists who were making work um, about the war in Nigeria around the Oriolo Kun Center in um, Ife that did, you know, explicitly portray starving victims. Um, but those are kind of the only few examples that I've really found. And you bring up a really good point that there's more concern about the military um, and what is happening with, like, politically with the military takeover 
um, which makes sense because that reflects these artists' realities way more because they were removed from the fighting. They didn't see direct, um, they didn't see direct conflict the way that the Afrin artists did. Um, instead of really focusing on the violence and the absence of the Asaba massacre is something that is really um, that is quite stark in the fact that it's missing. And to my knowledge, there was not, I don't think Moko has made a work about the Asaba massacre, to my knowledge, or really um, any, well, not any of the artists in my dissertation, but any of the artists in this chapter, to my knowledge, have, has not made a work about the Asaba massacre, which I might think maybe points to, um, it was talked about at the time, at least it was known in, in Biafra at the time, um, but it might point to the fact that this was buried, um, and as, especially with the question that was asked in the chat that the vanquished have not been really allowed to tell their stories, um, that it was a narrative that was effectively crushed by the no, victor, vic, no victor, no vanquished um, slogan that arose during the war and the, and the effective silence on the war. Um, that was instituted by the FMG in the immediate post-war period that really continued on um, up until the present moment. But now it's that silence is beginning to thaw a little bit. Um, so I guess I can talk touch on that story or that question really quickly. How can the vanquished tell their story in Nigeria today? Um, one of the things that I have argued in my own research is that it's really through art um, especially artists who were affiliated with former Biafra or lived through the war on the Biafran side, um, whether as adults or children, um, where that art becomes the sphere where that story can be told and at least keep that memory alive um, up until recent years, where now it has become more acceptable um, and really just almost unavoidable to talk about the, the war and Biafra. Um, and yeah, the, the German exhibition and history of Biafran art, I, I actually don't know the artist's exact reaction like in Nigeria to that exhibition. Um, another thing that I actually took out for purposes of time in this was that Bruce and Obrock, you know, Uchi Okeke was actually actively writing out Bruce and Obrock Payen Demas Moko um, from the history of natural synthesis and really just creating this history of natural synthesis that flowed from Eastern artists who were affiliated with the group through to what was happening in Biafra. Um, so it became much less focused on, I mean, it, it, like Nigeria, in order to really just completely divorce Biafran art from Nigerian art, he did that by just not talking about um, what other artists were doing who did not have their homeland in the East. Um, and and so for for somebody like Bruce Onobrak Peya, where this pan-Nigerian eclecticism was his um, natural synthesis as inspiration, that would have been really kind of de artistically devastating um, to have this literal fracturing of the group going on um, within the more political and geographic fracturing. Um, of the um, of the of the nation, so that that's something that I argue a bit that's going on with that lament plastograph that he's not only um, that's he's not only mourning and 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 protesting the loss of cultural heritage that's happening because of the war, but actually he's lamenting the possible direction that Nigerian art is going to take because of the war. Um, 
And then, yes, Kingsley, thank you so much. Um, it's good to see you again um, about the exhibitions on both sides of the war um, as propaganda. Yes, definitely, they were propaganda. Um, I have not done, uh, it's part of what I want to do is a comparative analysis between the two. Um, and um, so that is definitely something that I am trying to pursue currently. And um, as part of this upcoming book project and Europeans um, receiving these artworks in, in Germany, the documentation is much more um, robust. Uh, it was met with um, seemingly a lot of interest and approval and it led to people donating money. Um, if you look at a guest book uh, from one of the exhibitions there, there were people, um, Germans, there were a lot of Africans um, who were living in Germany who visited, not just from um, Biafra, but also from other countries. Like, um, I think it was like a, people who were coming to see the show from Uganda, um, in the Uganda diaspora living in Germany, um, Kenya diaspora living in Germany. Um, so it attracted a really sympathetic um, crowd. And, and there were a lot of people who came and saw the exhibition and they actually brought schooled groups to see the exhibition as well. So it was seen as a, an important moment, especially with, it, with in the terms of education to show German children and German people what was going on at the time. Um, in England, it's much more difficult to figure it out. Um, there were a few exhibition reviews of it. Um, it was attended by high-ranking um, dignitaries on the Nigerian side and also um, some diplomatic figures on the British side as well. Um, but it's it's more difficult to for me to discern really what the British reaction um, to that to that show has was at the time. Um, and in terms of comparative analysis, to go back to Chijioke's comment, um, the, the Biafran works in the show organized by Uche Okeke were harrowing. They were of wartime violence. Um, they were of the returnees coming six massacres. There were start. There was one um, by Chooks and Wonwu that was depicted um, an emaciated boy standing or sitting in front of a building that was on fire because of an air raid. And so there were these really explicit images of war. Where in the Nigerian exhibition, a lot of the artworks were artworks that were made early in the earlier 1960s. Um, so not even necessarily artworks that were made during the war. And they were just kind of blanket statements about um, Nigerian artistic practices during the time. So they were meant to showcase more of the artists interests, um, their own personal artistic interests and their own cultural interests than saying anything really politically about the war other than the fact that Nigerian creativity is continuing. Um, and the way that I always think that that I've been thinking about it is that it has was really trying to promote this idea of unity and diversity, where you had artists who were coming from different ethnic backgrounds, drawing from their different ethnic heritages, all coming together to 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 showcase something that was called Nigerian art um, during you know a time like a united Nigerian art during a time that Nigeria was fighting a war for the saying that it was because they wanted to keep Nigeria one. Um, so it was the, the artwork in that exhibition was like there, I have, there wasn't a single one that, that explicitly acknowledged um, the actual violence that was shown in, in England. Uh, Nelson Doe uh, says, why one sees the artistic narrative apart from the artworks of other ethnicities as shown, are uh, there some images from evil artists that tackle the issues from evil perspective? Another commentator, I can't get the name, uh, says, thank you, Dr. Wu, for this wonderful presentation. 
My question revolves around your methodologies. What sources did you use to analyze the wartime activities and art of Nambrabea, Moko, and Yelani? How did you approach interpreting their artworks in the context of the Civil War? And its broader historical significance. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, speaking on our platform. And uh, I want to thank all those that are online. Please open your um, open your want to see your face. So take a good photograph. Those of you online, please open your cameras. Open your cameras so that uh, uh, we can have a good photograph for you. And then quickly, I want to announce the next program uh, on Wednesday. Third April, uh, when is the third April? We will have our uh, speaker number four, and he will be Dr. Dan Ladi Abba of the Department of History and International Studies, Bogus State University, Nanyemba, Nigeria. We will be speaking on power to the animals. It is Gender and inter ethnic funeral rights in the Gala Igbo in Soka borderlands of Nigeria. So, we'll be very glad to have you join us again on top April, Wednesday, top April 2024. Thank you very much for joining. We're very grateful that you found time to join us today. Thanks a lot. And God bless you. Uh, yeah,